Hello and welcome to another episode of Statistically Insignificant, a torture device in audio and visual format. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she and they, and I am the head statistical torturer in this department, menacing prisoners with a slide rule. Strapped to a rack and being beaten with a calculator, it's Bart. Hi, Bart. Hey, how's it going? I go by he and him, and since the last episode, I've got into some DIY electronics crafts, so um, I'm making synthesizer, and there's this cool Japanese guy who's doing something with like pipes and electronic fuses. I don't know what's going on there, but it seems a pretty cool project. <laughs> oh, maybe we should get you to do a uh, theme song at some point. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> this is the first time in a couple of months that we haven't actually had a guest. I have to say the logistics have been so much easier. There's only two moving schedules instead of three. Today we're also back to a bit of technical stuff. What does it mean for two things to have a statistical relationship, or not, and some of the forms that that can take? We talk about these relationships as probability structures, so we need to firm up our ideas about what probability is. Here are some basic rules that we need. These aren't the only ones, so this is not a rigorous definition of, pol- of probability. I was about to say polynomial, but that's something else entirely. <laughs> so first off, we have that the probability, which we're going to write P, of some event is a number between 0 and 1 inclusive, so it can be 0, it can be 1 where zero means something is impossible and one means that it is certain. If you have an event that's already happened, that's certain, so that would have probability one. So like if you've already flipped a coin and it's landed on heads, that has probability one. Yeah. If you're about to flip a coin with heads and tails and you're looking for, I don't know, stomach or something as an outcome, that is impossible. So that would have probability zero. Unless you weight the coin. You still wouldn't get stomach then. Edge is a little different. <laughs> Two, the probability that something happens out of all the possible things that you could observe is one. What I mean by that is you have some set of possible outcomes. To observe an event means that something happens. The reason we have to kind of be clear about that is because looking at the collection of all possible things that can happen actually tells us a lot about probability theory. Three. Does that mean, um, so if you're observing something and something can't happen... um then that is like, uh, I don't know what I'm asking. I'm so sorry. No, no, no that, that's okay. This is um, one of the harder things to deal with because it is quite abstract. So let's think of our coin example. You've got heads, tails, very, very small probability of edge. And let's say something else, I don't know, three. You can't observe a three on your heads or tails coin, right? Yeah. So what do you mean in that context? Uh, just that, um, like, for example, if you're, uh, if you're looking at a... I don't know. If you're looking at a tree and um, deciding the probability of whether it be knocked down in a windstorm, is it still something happened if the outcome is that it just stays as is? Oh, okay. So there your options are is knocked down or is not knocked down. Right. Yeah. So, so something so... still happens in that case. If yeah, yeah. Knocked down. Yeah. Yep. So the, yeah. So one of the things you have to be careful about when you're dealing with probability theory is defining what your possible outcomes are. And so in this case, like if we talk about uh, it with our heads, tails, edge example, heads, tails, or edge is one. So if, if any of these happen, then we have observed an outcome, right? Right. Yep. Okay. So probability three, probability of two events which cannot occur at the same time, we call mutually exclusive. This is the probability of event one plus the probability of event two. So we have to do mutually exclusive here because if there's overlap, we need to account for that overlap, but we're not going to look at it in this case. So if we think about this, if I am looking at my coin, I'm going to flip my coin once. I am looking at the possibility of observing either heads or tails. So it's a mutually exclusive because we're not living in a world where I could ha- have it land with both sides up. But uh, I can look at the probability of both, which would be the probability of observing heads plus the probability of observing tails. Right. Uh, this same ho- idea holds for multiple events, but the mutually exclusive bit is really, really important. Because uh, if you have like something with overlap, you can wind up counting that overlap multiple times. We're not going to worry about that so much here. We want to think about two different variables happening in sequence. Imagine we're rolling a die and and then flipping a coin or something like that. The first event we're going to call A. Uh, It has three possible values, which I'm going to write as A1, A2, and A3. 
we can only observe one of these anytime we observe A, so all of these are mutually exclusive, and at least one must happen when we observe A. So the probability of observing A1, A2, or A3 is equal to 1, which is equal to the probability of the first one plus the probability of the second one plus the probability of the third one. What these actually are doesn't matter so much. We just want to know about the probability structure like this. And in a second, we'll talk about the different probability of each one. We also have a second variable, which we're going to call b, and it has two possible values, b1 or b2. So we've got one with three, one with two. We're going to look at a sequence where we observe something in A, then something in B. And we can use what's called a tree diagram to represent this. So our first uh, move can have A1, A2, or A3 as possible outcomes. And from there, we can observe either B1 or B2. But we can observe B1 or B2 regardless of what we observed in the first case. So in this, each edge represents the um, the outcome of coming to a particular node. So like this top edge here represents observing A1. Uh, this uh, middle edge here represents observing A2. And from there, you have your second round. And from A1, you can then observe B1 or B2. And yep. we represent the um, second round after the first as further branching of the tree because we want to talk about possible differences in the probability at each point. Yeah. Is this how um, like multis for betting odds are calculated? I have no idea, I'm going to be honest. <laughs> Fair. It would not surprise me, though. If we are looking at a sequence of observations, we follow a path through the tree. So the path of observing A1 and then B1 ends up with you in this top node here. The uh, path of observing A2 and then B2 gets you to this location here in the tree. The outcome at the second stage is conditioned on the outcome at the first one, which is, again, why you've got that branching tree stuff. And this allows us to talk about probability of those sequences. We're going to introduce probability now. We're going to have all of the A's be equally likely. So this is the probability of A1, and it's going to be a third because there's three possible outcomes. Mm -hmm. This is probability A2, which is also going to be a third. Probability A3, also going to be a third. Now we come to the second level. What goes on here is not the probability of B1. It's the probability of B1 if we have already observed A1, which we write in a slightly different way, and we have to deal with slightly differently. So mm -hmm. I'm going to put an arrow there. So this is P B1 if A1, right? Yep. We're going to put a half there. Likewise, down here, this is going to be probability B2 if A1. And the same idea applies to the other branches. You just look at what branch you've come out of to know what you're conditioning on. For the moment, we're just going to say they're all the same all the way down. One of your paranoias, if you have to do this, is that the sum of the probabilities branching out from a particular point must be 1. Ah, there. And uh, my par paranoia has already spotted that, that should be a three, <laughs> not a two. Yeah, see, this is why we check. So in the first is case... It, is it paranoia if it's an accurate fear? Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just because you're not paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. Wasn't that a t-shirt <laughs> like 15 years ago or something? Anyway, so to look at this, we look at the first one. So we've got a third plus a third plus a third, right? So that accounts for all of the possible outcomes on that first event. So the probability of something, I and G, in first round is three times a third, which is in fact one. So that's good. Uh, that means our probability of observing something in the first round is one. Mm -hmm. When we come to the second round, we have to look at the conditional probability. So we come to a branch out of a particular event, so we look at the branches coming out of the A1 event. Within this, the probabilities should also add to 1. So here we have a half plus a half, because those are the two possible things you can observe in the second round after you've observed A1. Yeah. The same should be true of the other branches, not necessarily that they are a half and a half, but that these should add up to 1. Uh -huh. So we've looked at 
realistically, the events separately. But we can talk about the probability of a sequence as well. So let's say we want to look at the sequence A1, B1. So in the first instance, we have probability a half of going down the A1 path. In the second instance, we have probability, sorry, a third. In the second instance, we have a probability a half of going down the B1 route. So the probability of A1, B1 is the probability A1 times the probability B1 if A1, which is a third times a half, which is a sixth. So the probability, mm -hmm. and I might as well put a little ampersand to say A1 and B1 up here, of winding up in this terminal node is a sixth. In maths, we would call this the intersection, when both A1 and B1 occur. But because I find and much easier to think about than intersection, I'm just going to say and. We can do the same thing for all of the other terminal branches. They're also all going to be a sixth because they're, all of the probabilities are the same. Each of these represents the probability of winding up in a terminal node, so that is the probability of observing a particular sequence. There are six possible sequences represented by all of the terminal nodes here, and we can think about the probability of observing any sequence. So the probability of any sequence, well, all of these are mutually exclusive. You can't observe A1, B1 at the same time as you observe A3, B1, because those are different in, like events that can happen. Yep. So this is going to be the sum of the probability of each individual sequence, which is going to be, well, the six events, or oh, six sequences, each one has a probability one-sixth. So this is going to be six times a sixth, which is one. That's good. That means my calculations haven't been stuffed up somewhere along the way. That tells us that we have worked out the total probability of observing a sequence. But we haven't actually seen the probability of either of the Bs on its own. Because the Bs in here are conditioned on having observed A already. Yep. So what we need to do to work out the probability of, say, B1 is we need to add up the probability of all the sequences that B1 occurs in. So that is this one, this one, and this one down here. So this equals probability of A1, B1, plus probability of A2, B1, plus probability of A3, B1. Well, now, because each of them has probability of six, this is three times one on six. So that is a half. Mm-hmm. The same construction applies to B2. We can also see that B2 would be a half because there's three of them, this one, this one, and this one, and they're a sixth. So the probability of B2 is also a half. So is there value of um, back calculating in, in that way as opposed to just going off the half that you have already have branching uh, off A1? I'm about to show you an example when they are not the same. So remember that this a half here is the probability of B1 if... A1. This is not necessarily the same as the probability of B1. Right. It is in this case. So we've worked out everything that we need for this situation. Now we can talk about the relationships between the variables. Running your eye over this tree, you can see that the probability of each B outcome doesn't change across the three probabilities of A. To a statistician, that indicates that there isn't a relationship between A and B, because how we think of that relationship is the outcome of A would change the probability that you observed in B. We have a formal definition for this. So we say that two variables are independent if the probability of one does not depend on the outcome of the other. I believe this was the inspiration for rolling it, Roland Emmerich to make uh, Independence Day. <laughs> and we actually have a, a mathematical way of representing that relationship. So the probability of, I'm going to call it A, I, and... B, K, so this is some value from A and some value from B, so A sequence, is the product of the probability of A, I and the probability of B, K. So when this holds for all values in each of the variables, we have what we are called independent values. So for all A, I and B, K. All right, that's a very technical definition. Let's think about this in terms of our tree diagram. 
So what that means is that the probability at the end here, which is the probability of A, I, and B, K, must be the product of the probabilities of A, I, and the probability of B, K that we've calculated here. Yep. In this case, we can eyeball it and see that that's true. The probability of A1, B1 is a sixth, which is the product of a third, which is the probability of A1, and a half, which is the probability of B1. And it's the same all the way down the tree. It has to be true for everything in order for the overall property of independence to hold, which makes it somewhat harder to prove that things are independent than that they aren't. If you want to prove that two variables are independent, you have to check every single possible combination. If you want to prove that they aren't, you only need to find one where it doesn't work. So I'm going to keep most of the same probability here. We have a third for each of the first steps. Not a half, a third. Wow, I'm not doing well today. We're going to have a half off the branches from A2. But for A1, we're going to have something different. So for B1 after A1, we're going to have a third. And for B2 after A1, we're going to have two thirds. We can now immediately see that the probability of the Bs depends on what you got in A. Because the probability of the branches coming out of this A1 node are different to what you see in the other nodes. That means there's a relationship here. That means your probability for B depends on what you observed in A, which is non-independence. Would it likely go down this way, where in the other two modes you have the same probability, but in one particular node it, it is um, attached, in the, uh, attached in this way? No, in the sense that this is far too neat an example. Uh, this right. is very much, yeah, yes, yeah. so this is a very artificial situation where we can see all the probabilities. We'll talk about real life in a second. So if we want to check our actual formal definition, the first thing we need to do is recalculate the probabilities. The probabilities for A haven't changed, the probabilities for B have. So what we get here is, at our intersection, uh, we have, that's 1 on 9, that is 2 on 9. This is a sixth, a sixth, a sixth, and a sixth. Now, this should still add up to 1, because 1 on 9 plus 2 on 9 is a third, and we have another third in each of these branches. So we're still okay with our overall definition of probability. But we need the probability of B1, which is a ninth plus a sixth plus a sixth, which is 4 on 9. And the probability of B2 is equal to 2 on 9 plus 1 on 6 plus 1 on 6, which is going to be 5 on 9. The probability of A1 and b2 is 1 on 9. The probability of a1 times the probability of b2 is a third times 4 on 9, which is, oh god help me, 4 on 27. These are not the same. Mm -hmm. So because these are not equal, we have found our counterexample, and these variables are no longer independent. We don't need to calculate any of the rest because we only need the one counterexample. Yeah, uh, hmm. I would say yes. Uh, some people would probably say you would have to say not independent. Right. Yeah, it's one of those things where the English language sucks to deal with actual preci precise definitions. Yeah. That's our technical definition sorted, right? If all of them have this equality between the product of the of the um, probabilities and the probability of the uh, sequence that is independent. If it, you have one violation, it is not independent. In the real world, we don't get access to these probabilities, even if we have a probabilistic system and are just using them to model it. Instead, we have to estimate them based on what we can observe. In a situation like this, what we could observe is a whole collection of sequences from some AI and some BK, and then we look at the relative frequency that those occur in to try and work out what the underlying probabilities are. We're going to look at one way of testing for evidence of non-independence in cases like this, where you have two variables which have some sort of finite number of possible values. In this case, we have our A variable with three, our B variable with two. And I have phrased this very carefully. We are taking our status quo to be that the variables are independent. So this becomes a test for independence, and it has a null hypothesis, which is that A and B are independent. So we're asking, is there enough evidence? Have we observed 
enough of weird frequencies in the actual sequences that we think there is evidence against independence. So our alternative is that A and B are not independent. Would there be a circumstance where the um, null hypothesis is that they are not independent? Not in this framework of hypothesis testing. Right. Yeah. So um, in in this framework, it's called Frequentist Statistics, we privilege some sorts of, of things. So in this case, we privilege no relationship on the basis that having a relationship is somehow more complex, requires more explanation. I mean, that's true in real life. <laughs> It's not it, look. It's not a philosophically unreasonable position to take. Uh, <laughs> I do think that there are certainly like shortcomings with it, but I understand and see our episode on what is statistics for for a bigger discussion of this. I think it's a reasonable starting point. What we're looking for in this is: is there some sequence uh, A I B K which occurs more or less often than we expect? There might be more than one. But you only need at least one. Just as up here, we only needed one counterexample. But what we look at for this test is a kind of overall deviation from what we expect to see if independence is true. This isn't a very strong statement. It doesn't tell us anything about how the relationship behaves. The way we calculate the statistics doesn't even tell us which pair violates that definition. It's the, hey, something is going on here test. For the hardcore nerds in the audience, this is called a chi-squared test for independence. The assumptions of this test are that we have two variables that have discrete possible values and there are finitely many of them. We don't assume any kind of ordering, we don't assume any kind of additional structure on those, just some categories in each one. To perform our tests of these hypotheses, we assume that the null hypothesis is true, that the variables are independent, and compare what we expect to see when that is the case if these variables are true, then the probability of some AI and some BK happening will be the product of the probabilities. And will we compare this to what we actually observe? If independence is true, we expect the sequences, those uh, AI, BKs, you're know, like A1, B1, and so on, to occur roughly with this probability. Of course, we have to estimate all of these probabilities from the observations, that's where the roughly comes in, but I'll show you how we do that. We use a tool called a frequency table to do this, which counts how many of each of the sequences we've observed. So if we have at the top here A1, A2, and A3, we have on our uh, rows B1 and B2, then what we get out in, say, this column here, in this cell here, is the number of sequences A to B1 that we actually observe. So I'm going to put some uh, made up numbers in here. And what we also do with this is we calculate column and row totals. So the total number of B1s observed, sequences with B1, is 65, which is the sum of 20, 35, and 10. Total number of B2s was 84. Then we have 72 sequences with A1, 46 with A2, and 31 with A3. This gives us a total number of observations of 159. What we get from that is our estimate of the probability of getting A1 is equal to the total number of observations from A1, so 72, divided by the total number of observations, 159. This is our estimate of what that probability is. Yep. And if you remember, we wind up using that estimate here, and we need the estimate for B as well. So what you do if you're going to calculate the whole thing is you would basically use this to construct what you expect to see under independence. So our expected value in the cell I K is equal to the probability of A I times the probability of B K so that's the probability of being in the AI row and the B, so AI column and the BK row. Sorry, not divided by, times, times the total number of observations. The logic here is that under independence, this is the probability of AI BK, right, based on this relationship here. Mm -hmm. 
And if we multiply the probability by the number of observations, we get what we expect to see for the number of observations of that sequence. Right. Wouldn't this be um, thrown out somewhat by just like randomness in and of itself? Like, for example, if, yeah, so if you toss a coin 100 times, your chances are 50-50 each way, but... That You're not going to see 50 and 50, yeah, exactly. yeah, for sure. So this is why these are estimates, and this is why we use a statistical model for this, and we don't just say, oh, we saw something that's not exactly what we expect to see, so that means it's not independent. We have, like, an error margin, I suppose. Yeah. So what we do with each of these, and calculating one of these for each cell is a pain in the ass, as you might imagine, you've got to do six of them in this case, is we compare what we have observed to what we expected in each particular cell. So what that looks like is you take what you observed, you subtract off what you expected to see, and that gives you the difference for the cell IK from between the two of those. You square this because you want it to... Whoopsie. You want it to always be positive. If you get a negative difference, you don't want that to be balanced out by a positive difference somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And you divide by what you expect to see. The reason you basically weight by how many you expect to see is because a difference of like two in a cell where you've expected to see like a hundred is not that big. Whereas a difference of two in a cell where you expected to see ten has more of an impact, right? Yeah. To get our test statistic, we calculate this for every cell, and then we add them up. So our test statistic, we'll call it T, equal to the sum of these guys. And what that does is it's a bit like a weighted average, except what you're averaging here is the squared differences between what you've observed and what you expected to see. If what we've observed is very different to what we expected to see, T will be large. If they're about the same, t will be small. What that means is that a large value for this sum indicates that we probably have something going on that's not independence. Whereas if t is equal to zero, then that means that o i k is equal to e i k everywhere. So we have exactly what we would expect to see under independence. This would be extremely suspicious because by randomness, as you mentioned, we never expect to actually see that behavior. So if I saw this, I would suspect that my uh, data was synthetic and like generated in a lazy fashion. So somebody was <laughs> trying to fuck with me and doing it badly, basically. So what we're doing in this hypothesis test is basically asking, is this sum big enough to make us think that these things aren't independent? What counts as big enough is itself a complex question, and we have to decide what the threshold for that is. I'm not going to really go into that because it's very like situation dependent, but if you go back to our um, episode on p-values, for example, that idea of an alpha threshold, a threshold of significance, is how you decide what counts as enough evidence. If the number was sort of edging up to the line of, accept of uh, acceptable there, would you pro probably have to take the test again or something like that? Like This is the problem with a hard cutoff test for significance. Because stuff that's borderline, well, you really have to think hard about what you consider that evidence for. And, like, in general, this framework of hypothesis testing doesn't have a good answer for what you do when stuff is close to the line. It's one of those things where, um, because this was set up to be used in decision making where you don't have like a fuzzy definition there you can't say oh well we don't know if this really works or not so we'll half produce it or we don't know if this policy works or not so we'll half implement it despite the best efforts of government if you have that kind of binary decision then at some point you have to have a like retain reject threshold unfortunately that's scientifically very messy it's more of a social construction than it is a scientifically justified one is this one of those uh, things that came up in the wake of, like, mutually assured destruction in the Cold War? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, so the very early stuff done with this was basically on crops. So uh, you would have, like, well, so much of early statistics was based around the idea that you were trying to grow crops better, so or trying to measure differences in, like, populations and things. Generally, they were they were building tests that had to deal with small number like amounts of data because you can't necessarily afford to have two hundred thousand like plots that you're testing different fertilizers on. You might have thirty 
or fewer. Mm. In that sort of context, the decision is, do we use fertilizer A, B, C, or whatever? How much of that fertilizer should we be using? And those are, like, the how much is somewhat more of a variable sort of decision. You might test different amounts of fertilizer and say, well, the best performance was between these two amounts, so we'll take the average of those. Or this amount clearly outperforms the rest, so we'll use that. Yeah. Yeah, but the binary decision of which fertilizer to use or to use a fertilizer or not, you have to make that decision at some point. So I'm not going to walk you through the calculations for all of these six cells because frankly that's a pain in the ass, but we will go through one. So I am going to do the calculation for the E11 and O11. Mm -hmm. O11, the observed value was 20. The expected value is going to be the row total divided by the observed the total number of observations times the column total divided by the total number of observations so those are our estimates for the probabilities right mm -hmm. and then multiplied by the total number so this is 65 on 159 times 72 on 159 times 159 which is 29.43 i will make a point here suddenly we've got a decimal we don't ever actually expect to see a decimal value for a count because it's very difficult to get 0.3 of a person without, you know, serious violence or something. <laughs> so this is a mathematical artifice. This isn't representing actually having 0.3 of a person. Our calculation then for what this term would be in the sum, which is O11 minus E11 squared divided by E11, which is... 20 minus 29.43 on up squared on 29.43 is equal to 3.01. So instead of showing you the calculation of this for every single cell, I'm going to instead tell you that the total sum for this table is 131.71. This number doesn't have a hell of a lot of context, right? Because you don't know what big looks like. Yeah. But I'm going to tell you, this is a bit bigger than zero. We expect <laughs> sure. to see something close to zero if we have independent values. So to get to that number, do you add up all of the the 3.0 number? Do you, you add Yeah, so we do this table? for each of these six cells, and then we add them up. Yeah. As you can see, this becomes excruciating the uh, bigger the table is. Uh, <laughs> and generally I don't make my students do this by hand for anything more than like a two by two we do it with a three by two and beyond that you go hey computer I'm not doing this myself <laughs> <laughs> typically in practice you get a computer to do it as well but anyway so to understand what this represents with regards to our hypothesis test I'm going to tell you the p-value if you haven't seen our p-value episode go back and have a watch of it if you know what p-values are, then you probably don't need to do that. But how I will define the p-value in this context is it is the probability of getting t, which was our test statistic, greater than or equal to what we've actually observed, which is 131.71, if a and b are independent. This is our assumption of the null hypothesis. This p-value is a probability in the world where that null hypothesis is true. And in our case, a p-value is very small. In fact, it's smaller than 2 times 10 to the minus 16, which is like 0 with 16 zeros and then a 2. <laughs> that means this value is very unlikely to have happened, or this value or more extreme, so more different from what we expect, if we actually have an independent variables here. Yeah. That would probably be enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. This is certainly smaller than any alpha threshold you would ever see. We can actually go back and have a look at this table and think about it, right? I invented these numbers, but I invented them in a way which I was pretty sure would give me a statistically significant result. How I did that was, if you look at this A2 column here, in A1 and A3, your B1 value is less likely than your B2 value. But in A2, it's swapped. The B1 value is more likely than the B2 value. Gee, that looks an awful lot like having different probabilities after one of your A values, doesn't it? So what this is really saying is that something 
funny is going on here because in my head when I was making it up, I just kind of swapped which of these was the higher. Mm -hmm. And that gives you a non-independent result because I have changed the observed probability of B1 and B2 in relation to A2 as compared to the others. So you would be likely to be able to spot independence or not just from looking at the numbers on a table? If it's something like this, yes. But in general, it's not so glaring. Like, right. if you've got a much smaller difference between these two, let's say instead of this one for A2 being higher than, uh, sorry, this one where A2 is paired with B1 being higher than when A2 is paired with B2, maybe it's just a little bit lower than the other one. So this one, your B1 is less than half of B2. This one, B1 is less than half of B2. Mm. What if this one, instead of being less than half, it was like maybe two thirds? That could still be evidence of a relationship, but you wouldn't spot it just eyeballing the chart. Right. Yeah. So I would not rely on that intuition if I was doing the test. I would do the test. Sure. I do rely on that intuition if I'm inventing data to make a point. No, for sure. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. For now, I want to look at a different sort of relationship, one that has a specific structure. So in this, all we've been able to say is something funny is going on here. We have non-independence. Now I want to talk about straight lines. Here we have two variables which behave like numbers, and I can ask about how they change in relationship to each other. This is known as linear, by which I mean line, correlation. So I've got my x and I've got my y here. This is probably the most common correlation st statistic that gets used for numerical measurements. So correlation, correlation, is just a, a term we use to refer to how numerical variables change together. Yeah. We'll do another episode on correlation in greater detail in the future. More generally, those statistics are used to measure how strong a relationship is, but in the case of linear correlation, we are specifically looking at the strength and direction of a straight line relationship, which looks something like this. So we have some scatter in this data. Mm -hmm. So the relationship isn't perfect, but you can imagine a straight line going through the middle here that more or less describes what that trend is. Yep. This is a positive relationship because as X increases, so does Y. A negative relationship would go like that instead. So as X increases, Y decreases. So that's the like positive negative. But in terms of interpreting how strong the relationship is, we look at how close the data is to the line. Data that looks like this, where it is perfectly on a line, would have correlation one mm -hmm. because it's positive, because it's going upwards, and it's one because it's perfectly on the line. Something like this would probably have correlation about 0 0.9. Mm -hmm. Also, if we were going downwards, something like this would have correlation minus one. If we had some scatter, it would be correlation minus 0 0.9. That sort of idea. Mm -hmm. The other thing I will say is that this does not care about the slope. So I can have correlation like this would be correlation one. Correlation like this would also, like this. So mm -hmm. these are much less steep and much more steep. The only way, place where things don't work is if you have a horizontal or a vertical line. Because these do not vary with respect to one variable. So your horizontal line has the same value for y at every point. So there is no variation in y to compare to variation in x. Yep. Your vertical line... Same value for x at every point. There is no variation in x to compare to the variation in y. So our heuristic here is one, perfect positive relationship. I'm going to put in brackets, straight line. If you're waiting for it, dear listener, I'm trying to be classier than all the jokes that are in my head about like per perfect positive or negative relationships. So. <laughs> Minus one is a perfect negative relationship. This is where you neg somebody. <laughs> I'm not above it. But what about zero? You get zero when you have no evidence of a linear relationship between the variables. So that can mean that they're scattered all over the place, like this. So there's not really a trend here between X and Y, right? It's just kind of a blob in the middle. A trend would look something like, yep, yeah, maybe it's like that, or whatever, right? Or you would get zero correlation for this. This is 
approximately, uh, taking into account my shitty drawing skill skills, a perfect circular relationship between X and Y. But that's not a straight line. And in fact, because it is a perfect uh, spread, because you have exactly the same amount of variation between X and Y in both directions, you get correlation zero. Plus it's shaped like a zero. Yes. This is still a relationship. A really strong one, in fact. It's just not a relationship that can be measured with your straight line correlation. This is one of the reasons that you should be very careful about someone citing a correlation statistic without also plotting the data, because there may be relationships that they just haven't observed. Something else that would have correlation zero. So uh, for the listener only, I have drawn four clusters of data. They are quite distinct clusters, but they are placed in a grid. So as above, in this case, you have like variation in X and Y, but it's done in such a way that there's no linear relationship. It can be really important to plot and see clustering like this because that can be evidence that you actually have different subpopulations within whatever data you're looking at. One of the things that I tell students all the time is to plot their data because otherwise you miss stuff like this. It's not common to see like perfect relationships that just aren't linear, but what you can see is non-linear relationships that you can still get a non-zero correlation out of. So if we have data that looks like this, so uh, for the listeners I have drawn an upwards curve. I'm going to put a red line through it. You could still fit a straight line to this, you could still estimate the correlation of that straight line, but it would be estimated the correlation of a straight line like this, and it will underestimate the actual strength of that red uh, curved relationship. It also means that if there is an underlying relationship that has a non-linear structure, like this red line here, fitting a linear model to it is a bad idea because it doesn't represent what's actually going on in the underlying structure. One of the checks you do if you're doing any kind of model, like a linear model or something, is to plot your data and make sure nothing funny is going on which would make that model inappropriate. So at some point in the near future, I'm going to have a whole big rant about modeling stuff. It'll probably be a bonus episode because it's going to be a little bit more mathematical. But for the minute, these are the sorts of relationships we can look at. These have non-independent behavior. Uh, so this would be approximately independent. This is distinctly not independent. This is distinctly not independent. So we can use ideas of dependence and uh, of independence to talk about this, but because we have more structure here, there are better tools to do it. But thank you so much for coming on again. Thank you as ever for having me. No, don't worry. I'll see you later.